Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning back into Let's Play Chroma Squad. I'm your host, Theronin of Dreams, and today is a bonus episode. You see, I had some material I wanted to include in the premiere, but with the length of the premiere for Season 2 being, well, longer than normal, I did kind of have to cut a few things, namely, showcasing off our new squad. But I also wanted to look at some of the changes that the director's cut has happened to introduce, as well as some of the small changes that happened with the RNG elements between this squad's playthrough of Season 1 and our original squad's playthrough of Season 1. But we're going to start with this new squad. Now, the Super Sentai Selection Draft Board took a serious look at all the different nominations for leadership candidates for our new Chroma Squad team, but ultimately we have selected the one and only Bender from Futurama. See, Bender campaigned hard with bribery between beer, blackjack, hookers, and a very, very strong motto, the Super Sentai Selection Draft Board had to choose him. After all, not many folks can get away with telling their enemies to bite my shiny metal ass. Bender's actually kind of a wonderful leadership pick. He's a little bit off meta, but plus 30% health from the Asthma Law actor, in addition to the leads plus 50% health, means we could play him as selfishly as the theme would dictate. He can get anywhere he wants and survive it. While skill regen's a bit of a problem, it's not too bad on a leader. Next up is our assault, the one and only Takeshi Hongo! Takeshi is born and bred to be a common Rider reference, and the reason he won out as the assault pick, despite not originally listing as assault, well, I'm pretty sure that the folks who have played through this game and been a part of the thread know how we can even maximize that Riderisms. He has plus one movement from his actor, while most folks would consider not having a more plus attack to be less ideal, I find that this is an assault who's going to move like a scout would and still do all the damage he needs. Minus 20% weapon attack isn't even a problem for an assault either. You're rarely if ever using your weapon skill and, well, with the bonus attack from assault, your weapon skill's attack damage range is still pretty significant. I've got no qualms about using Takeshi Hongo and I can just hope I can do as many riderisms as possible but you're going to see plenty of punches and kicks coming out of him, and we're going to enjoy that assault. Moving on to our scout. Some say he's a special project done by the British government gone wrong. Others say he may have been watching Top Gear on Marathon the entirety of his childhood. All we do know is we have a reckless and crazy Stig wannabe in The Stuntman! And really, let's be honest, this is Stig 2.0 in a lot of ways. I love the choice of Antitonic for this particular Scout, too. He's not technically the most meta of picks for Scout, but I'm never going to complain about extra dodge on a dodge-oriented character. The minus one movement cancels out that Scout roll bonus, so we're not going to see him quite as mobile as most Scouts, but the extra 10% health is going to help had issues when we get to some skills by opponents that are undodgeable. That and dodge caps at 95%, so there's always the chance you're going to get wrecked. The extra health mitigates that pretty well. Uh, look forward to seeing Stuntman being pushed out further afield than other characters, especially probably more in Season 3 and onwards, as we really get his kit cemented to enjoying that dodge, and really just being a thorn in enemies' sides. Uh, the other thing about having Antitonic as Scout is it maintains another element from our prior squad. Different role, perhaps, but everyone does enjoy a little bit of consistency, so we'll run with it. Next up, we have our Techie. The Super Sentai Selection Draft Board would like you to know that Extraterrestrial allies are something we've been looking forward to seeing quite a lot. <laughs> Did we say extraterrestrial? Forgive us. Chris Salid simply is a human with a very unusual skin condition. While Chris Salid may be considered frail by the average human health standards, Chris Salid is the best possible techie, for he is the best possible technician that was available to the Super Sentai Selection Draft Board. 
We hope that you will enjoy Crystal Lid's contributions to the Karma Squad project. <coughs> I, I, I kind of liked the gimmick with Crystal Lid. The XCOM references are fine, and while the minus 30% health is going to make him very, very vulnerable in the long run, at the difficulty level I'm showing this game off, it shouldn't be too big of a concern. Meanwhile, plus 10 skill regen, and on top of techies gaining it for just using skills, we can see skills being used every turn by the techie. Last but not least, we have our assist. The Super Sentai Selection Draft Board is quite happy to introduce Cat, a PE teacher by day, a Super Sentai team member by night. Cat looks to inspire the next generation to enjoying Super Sentai and being healthier. Again, small cute little gimmick, and if any member on our cast happens to be the most meta choice recommended by guides and other playthroughs, Cat probably is one. Uh, the Angry Johansson has good skill regen, no malice is unlike the techie, and plus one fan conversion rate. And while that particular stat may not seem too amazing, it really builds on itself to allow you to really abuse the marketing mechanic in the game. So I have no qualms about using this particular assist, and, well, frankly, she'll make up for some of the, the shortcomings of having a very frail techie. Getting, uh, having enemies get past your frontliners, especially when we have Bender and Stuntman out ahead of everything, makes them a little vulnerable. But she's going to be a great healing asset, and we should see some good things coming out of our assist moving from here on. Not saying I, I minded the assist of Jay Blues, he's the other meta topic, but we got good setups. Now here I took a moment to keep just a little bit before the transformation sequence to show. When you fast forward, there's a VCR-like effect. And they do at least update your transformation sequence to the color scheme of your team. Now Transit Mancer went down like a chump the first time around, and I'm going to say right now he's going to do it again. You see, one of the bigger changes to mecha fights is your percent to hit now influences the range of your skill bar. Much like defending, it's all about timing, which means you're not likely to have to stack hit percent nearly as much, because there's no RNG to it, it's just how well you are at it. The other thing that was already propped up is that there are now director's instructions for the mecha fight. Now I'm not entirely clear on whether or not that's going to earn you more audience, but it makes audience manipulation even less of a need, so you could get some really cheap and cheerful studio options. Meanwhile, Transitmancer, again, he just goes down like a chump. Now that's not all I'm going to look at from Mecha in this episode. Uh, much like the Super Sentai Selection Draft gimmick of presenting our new squad, I also wanted to show off a bit more about our Mecha, and namely the customization options and customization interface. So we're transitioning showing off a little bit of our season performance from the replay, noting that the contract amount is half of what it used to be for season two. So I gained less money just for beating the season, but I've got a lot to work with here. But I wanted to talk about the mecha. There are five pieces, each arm is considered separate, and legs are together. But you have four different options or build paths for each part, and they all focus on something different. For the chest, you have a lot of variation, defense, attack, but you also have different skills that are available with certain pieces of gear. Now, some gear gets it earlier than others, but the shield shell, the plus 70% defense, unless that's changed, that's just raw stats. I do feel that some of these have been changed, and I wish I had better notes from prior. For instance, the Titan's 50% improvement to mecha defense skill seems different to me. But, with the changes to hit percentage, I don't feel obligated to run the Hunter, for instance. Ultimately, with the difficulty I've chosen, with the changes that seem to be with the mecha fight mechanics, I'm probably just going to try and show off the different skills, and try and show off a number of different combinations for everything, because the skills are really... Well, they're the flashy element of mecha fights. Sure, if you can punch something to death every time, why not punch them? But 
Isn't it awesome to just use a, uh, a Mega Buster ripoff and blow them away for different segments? I'm really looking forward to just playing around with it, and I'm confident that the difficulty will let me do that and show everything off. Meanwhile, with the changes, I feel the defensive skills like Repair and Wonderwall and such are probably underutilized now. I don't think they're going to happen much. I don't think they're going to be needed much. But we will see how things go with the different mecha fights. Ultimately, I do plan on showing things off, but if the thread wants to see certain combinations of gear, as long as I can get the materials for it, I will do my best to showcase them. In any case, that brings us to the end of this bonus video. Now, certain other bits of content that I find throughout the game where I feel the need to describe differences between Director's Cut and the original, or anything that takes more time out of like a, fi a finale or premiere episode, I may do future bonus episodes like this, just depending on the content. In any case, thanks for joining me today, folks. Have fun out there, and stay frosty.